Rain was an ugly poor neglected child, who was forced to watch his family burn by the devil at a young age, and was abused as a slave by the hero's party for the rest of his miserable life. But even with all the bullying he endured, the hero kicked him out of their pathetic party, saying that he was as worthless as his cheating mother after he blew her back out. So when Rain heard those words, he punched Arios's disgusting face, telling him to never talk about his mama again like that, and left their party. Because throughout all those years, Rain had been deliberately pretending to be useless, and had secretly concealed his cheat leveling system for taming all the ultimate species, along with his forbidden ability to enslave the gods, and destroy the entire world one day. After finally making enough money to afford dinner for the first time in two weeks, he heard the voice of a girl screaming in the distance, and when he ran to the source, he saw a hot cat girl that was about to get devoured by a D-rank tiger. As the beast was about to slash her down, Rain attempted to stab the monster's neck, but his blade broke in half before getting launched to crash against the tree. As the tiger began approaching him, Rain screamed for the girl to run away, and prepared for his final moments, hoping he would at least buy her some time to escape. However, the girl swore that she would use all of her strength, and leaped into the sky before pushing herself to kick down at the tiger, defeating it in that instant. When he saw her broken physical power, he remembered that among the four ultimate species known to mankind, there was one that was so rare it was only heard about in the legends. So when she told him that she was a cat spirit, the rarest species, he ran to prevent her from falling inside of his arms. Her final words were that she wanted to devour his meat. I beg your pardon? A few moments later, the girl began devouring Rain's meat, thanking him for filling up her insides because she hadn't eaten anything for days. So she decided to introduce herself to him, saying that her name was Kanade, one of the last cat spirits alive. And after Rain introduced himself back, she sat next to him, saying she was glad an ugly guy like him saved her, and asked him to tell her more about himself. As they walked back to the Adventurer's Guild, Rain told her about his depressing life story, realizing she's the first person who's ever listened to him in his life. Once he was done with his story, Kanade felt sad that such a kind person like him was treated like trash, but he petted her on the head, telling her that he was okay. After stroking her, she told him that she was sure he was powerful, but even though he said he was just a useless beast tamer, she said that she was confident he could tame her. Because while he was saving her life, she realized he might be the only human in the world who could tame a cat spirit. So she offered to be tamed by him, and Rain thought that he would be able to prevent others from dying with the help of an ultimate species. However, he realized that it didn't even matter if she was an ultimate species, because he wanted to get to know her more. So he took off his glove and bit his finger, releasing the blood into his hand. As he extended it outward, he began chanting the taming spell, and his magical seals began encircling Kanade until a sigil formed on her arm, sealing their pact. Once she was done, she saw the symbol binding them together, and Rain couldn't believe that this wasn't a dream. As she extended her hand and held his, she began running along with him. At the Adventurer's Guild, Rain saw Roxanne. Fuck wrong show. Ruby congratulated Rain on completing his first quest and becoming an F-rank adventurer, but wondered how an ugly smelly loser like him was able to talk to a girl. But even though he had been paid 50 copper coins, he realized that it wouldn't be enough to get a room. But Ruby reminded him that no girl would want to get a room with someone that smelled like an anime convention anyway. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE However, some worthless creep came up to them, saying that he'd never found a cat spirit in real life before, and told her to leave the ugly moron she was tagging along with. Those words made Kanade scream at the man, saying that Rain was her hot master, but the man laughed in his face, thinking that there was no chance a weak person like him could tame the rarest ultimate species. But Kanade told him that Rain was stronger than he could ever be, so the man challenged Rain to an arm wrestling match saying that the girl would be their prize. Realizing that refusing this match would allow the man to chase against Kanade again, Rain decided to accept his deal, and grabbed his hand, determined to save Kanade from being in any danger. As soon as the man announced the beginning of the match, Rain smashed his worthless hand into the table, and Kanade announced him to be the winner. As he groveled on the ground, the man realized he wouldn't be able to have any more salty biscuit games. After dragging the worthless spineless dweeb away, Rain wondered when he'd become so strong. So Kanade told him that this was the side effect of his taming ritual. When taming ultimate species, their power is also transferred onto him, so he had gained the broken physical strength of cat spirits after taming her. Even so, she thought he was the greatest daddy for how powerful he looked protecting her, and wanted to go on their next adventure already. 
while they were gathering some grass because Rain likes to eat ass, Kanade heard the sounds of people screaming in the distance. And when they got to the site of the sound, they found a bunch of bandits attempting to rob a poor ugly old man. Seeing that they were part of the Shadow Clan, Kanade told Rain to fall back and get help first. But he knew they wouldn't have enough time, and told her that he wanted to save the man. He told her that he would distract them while she saved him, and after jumping and running like weeds, they began knocking all of them out while Kanade went to save the old man. However, three bandits were about to kill Rain, but he managed to hold them off, and Kanade realized that Rain might have been the only human able to tame a cat spirit, so she would never regret becoming his servant, but worried about her powers one day causing him to self-destruct. Because of that, she wanted to be the one fighting on the front lines, but as she watched him dodge the axe and knock all the bandits down, her floodgates began to open. All of the bandits decided to rush him at the same time, and Kanade wondered why she couldn't take her eyes off him while he's fighting, why her heart was pounding, and why there was water leaking from her put. After clapping all of the bandits, he wondered why her cheeks looked like they were the ones getting clapped, but she told him that she was just scared about him defeating them without a weapon. The old man thanked them for saving him from grave danger, but Rain told him that his ugly ass should have already been inside of a grave. After Rain thought about how his life was at risk, he decided to head straight into enemy territory. And while they were walking, he told Kanade that the Shadow Clan would begin targeting them soon anyway. However, Kanade thought it would be dangerous fighting hundreds of bandits alone. But Rain revealed that he had a secret ace up his sleeve. After a while of walking, they made it to their hideout, but Kanade began crying because she was about to die before developing plot. And while she was bent over, she told Rain that it wasn't too late for them to develop plot. However, Rain revealed that his ultimate weapon was a bee, and that he's tamed an army of them, revealing that he wasn't only a beast tamer, but that he was also an insect tamer. This was the first time Kanade's ever heard of a person mastering two classes, but Rain told her to get reinforcements while he destroyed all of the bandits, and she wondered if she was really helping him as his familiar. However, she just wanted an excuse to get on her knees for him and ran off to the capital. Eventually, the swarm of bees arrived, and Rain amplified all of their poison with his magic, before preparing to send them away. At the same time, the hero's party had barely managed to escape for their lives. However, Lean told Mina that it was all the new moron's fault, and began screaming at their replacement beast tamer for not scouting the area enough. After pulling away, Mina wondered if he really thought a single squirrel would be enough to study the area, so Lean told him that he should have tamed more than 20 squirrels to make sure they weren't ambushed. After hearing those words, the man wondered what the fuck they were talking about, because the overload of information from taming just two beasts would fry a person's brain. Lean wondered if Rain had actually been stronger than they all imagined, but instead, she called the man a useless tamer and a liar, promising to burn him alive if he didn't take blame for their party ditching the old man, so the beast tamer ran away before they would kill him. At the same time, Rain had managed to poison the entire bandit hideout and release the bees from their control. Just then, the adventurers came with Kanade, and they began restraining the bandits, but their leader was shocked that Rain can handle the entire Shadow Clan on his own. After they went away, Rain began petting Kanade, and she opened her mouth wide for him, but an earthquake began going off in the cave, and from the other side, a beast broke out of the prison, and three king lizards came out. The bandits revealed that they were waiting for this kind of moment. But the lizard killed the bandits and began destroying all the adventurers. As Rain attempted to shield Kanade, he punched one of the king lizards, and Kanade leaped from the back to kick the lizard away. Rain told the adventurers to take the bandits out of the cave, saying that he would handle the monsters. As he remembered how useless the old version of him used to be, he realized that things were different now, and with Kanade by his side now, he rushed to punch the lizard, glad that he'd finally found a companion because with her, he was able to defeat all of the monsters in his way. After a while, Rain came out of the cave, and everyone congratulated him on defeating them. So as he looked at Kanade, he realized it didn't matter whether she was an ultimate species or not, saying that with her by his side, he felt like he can do anything, and Kanade felt the same way. Later that night, Kanade was glad to finally have a nice bed, but Rain wondered why they would be in the same room and the innkeeper wished the ugly virgin loser luck lasting more than a minute. After defeating all the bandits, Rain was promoted to E rank, and with all the money he earned, he decided to get them a room, but never realized that they'd only have a single room available. Yes! 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 No! 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 
Hanaday tried dragging him back to the bed, but Rain said he can't ever sleep in the same room with a girl. However, Kanade told him that even though she was embarrassed, she was sure that Rain was just a worthless simp, who wouldn't even have the balls to do anything if a girl asked him to. EMOTIONAL DAMAGE! However, Rain told her that she shouldn't be so quick to trust people, but before he could leave, Kanade told him that she doesn't trust anyone except him, because after all, he's already risked his life countless times to save others, and said she could never let her master sleep outside. So Rain agreed to sleep in the room, but when she asked Rain to sleep in the same bed as her, he screamed that he'd never do that. While he slept at night, Kanade continued staring at Rain, realizing how great of a man he was, and that for all the pain he'd experienced, she wanted to be the one that healed his wounds, promising to stay by his side forever. A week after they'd been together, Ruby told them that there was a giant monster guarding the stride bridge. So because it was destroying all their trade, she asked him if he would be able to defeat the beast, saying that the reward was five gold pieces, and Rain's greedy ass accepted the quest immediately. When they got to the bridge, Kanade thought this bridge was definitely bigger than Rain's millimeter Peter, and when she wondered what the monster was like, a giant dragon appeared in the sky, descending onto the ground. As the dust settled, a hot-ass red hair appeared from inside, telling him that her name was Tanya, one of the second greatest ultimate species, the Dragonoids. She went on to say that she'd been looking for a strong opponent this entire time, so she offered to take them both on together. However, Kanade reminded him that she was also an ultimate species, and as soon as the match began, she rushed towards Rain with all her speed, but he narrowly blocked her blow. His strength shocked her, as most adventures had already been wiped out by that single strike. So she went on to give him the second test, blowing a flame from her mouth that they nearly avoided. Even so, Kanade's tail had been burnt, so she became mad and rushed towards Tanya. But before getting close, she ducked down and attempted to kick her away. But Tanya evaded her attack and began launching her own attacks. As Rain stared, he felt like it was cheating to intervene and leaped forward to attack her while she was distracted. But Tanya managed to hold both of them down, spinning them until she launched them into the sky. Realizing that they couldn't move in the air, Tanya prepared her ultimate blow and launched her fire breath towards them. But after the fog cleared, she saw that they had somehow survived her attack. Because in the last moment, they jumped off each other's feet to evade the fire, and Tanya congratulated them on being the first adventures to last this long. This was the power of a dragon, Rain realized, so he asked Kanade to buy him three minutes to execute his plan, saying he's confident they'll win. After running away, Kanade leaped towards Tanya to battle against her, but Tanya evaded her strikes, and when Kanade launched tens of strikes per second, Tanya was sure she'd run out of stamina soon. However, Kanade said that she was confident Rain's secret plan would work out, and he realized the moron was about to expose their whole plan. Even so, he tried focusing once more as he'd sensed a faint presence during their battle and located the bird that had been flying around, so after he tamed it, he asked for the bird to bring its friends. After a few minutes of Kanade and Tanya facing off, Rain told Kanade to leave the rest to him and summoned a swarm of birds to begin biting away at her. Their attacks weren't able to damage Tanya, so she knocked them all away, saying that a worthless attack like that would never harm a dragon. But just then, she began getting dizzy and fell onto her knees, realizing that she was paralyzed. As the bird landed on his arm, he told her that the birds were from the pedo species and released a large dose of poison that was enough to paralyze even the dragons. After Kanade hugged onto Rain to celebrate their victory, Rain asked Tanya to come with them. But when she thought he was going to sell her off, he told her that he just wanted to talk with her. However, she wondered why he would only want to talk, since he could do anything he wanted to her right now and thought he was the weirdest person she'd ever met, so Kanade began tickling her until she agreed to come along with them. Inside the Adventurer's Guild, Ruby was shocked that a pathetic adventurer like him was able to destroy the bridge's guard dog, and when she wondered if the girl was a dragon, Rain told her that she was just a weird-ass cosplay girl. However, Tanya pushed him away and said she was the queen of the skies, but before she could finish, Rain shoved something into her mouth and began leaving the guild. As they walked, Rain warned her that the town would be in a panic if they found out her identity, but she began going around showing off her powers and telling the kids that she was actually a dragon. Outside the town, Tanya apologized for exposing her secret to everyone, so Rain sighed, telling her that she should get as far away from this town as possible. However, rather than finding somewhere else to train, Tanya said she'd rather stick along with them for her training and hugged onto Rain, saying that she likes him for the way he protected her in the town. 
When Kanade began screaming at Tanya to get off her master, she wondered if she was jealous, saying that no one likes girls who can't share. At that moment, he wondered if Kanade would be okay with them joining her party, so although she was reluctant, Kanade accepted. After getting her approval, she told Rain to form a contract with her as well. But as he got ready, he never thought it would be possible to tame two ultimate species. As he bit his finger, the magical circle manifested, and Rain began forming his bond with her. The sealing ribbons began engulfing her, and after she agreed to become his servant, the taming sigil appeared on her hand, and their contract was sealed. Kanade told her to look at her hand, and she saw the magical circle, thinking it felt warm to always be connected to Rain. However, Rain thanked his hand because all those lonely nights he spent with his hand were finally paying off. Tanya grabbed onto his face, asking him why he was looking unhappy, saying she was looking forward to being his servant. That same night, the hero's party had wasted a week in the woods, and all of them realized how awful their lives were, without Rain doing all their heavy lifting. Just then, Arios realized that they should bring Rain back. After all, he was a gullible kind moron, so after they used his ass to clear out the lost woods, he planned on abandoning him once again. Meanwhile, the two girls began fighting over who would eat Rain's meat while he slept, so Tanya called her a flat board, and Kanade called her an overgrown Yuya disgusting fatso. The following morning, they began their first job in the forest, where they had to locate and exterminate all the slimes. Because while they were only F-rank monsters, they were able to spread rapidly and destroy farms, and Kanade hated them because they always made her wet. However, Tanya promised to deal with them for her, and Rain was glad that they were already getting along. After a few hours of not finding the slime, Rain decided to look from above, and when he found a bird, he activated his magic to assimilate into it. After a while, his consciousness left his body and fell onto Tanya's massive cannons, but Rain waved to them from the bird's body, saying he transferred his consciousness into the bird. Kanade wondered when he would stop being overpowered, but Tanya realized she could enjoy his unconscious body. When he asked what they were going to do to him, they screamed at him to leave already and wondered when his abilities became so broken. After a few minutes, Rain led them to the slime hideout, but before Kanade could smash them, Tanya asked him if he was able to use magic. However, Rain revealed that he was never able to do anything but light a candle, so Tanya told him to try casting a fireball towards the slime, and pushed him to get started already. As he looked into his hand, he attempted to remember the structure of the magical circles, and cast a giant fireball, destroying all the slimes with a single blow. This was just as Tanya expected, because when he tamed Kanade, he was able to gain the physical abilities of a cat spirit. So after he tamed Tanya, he was able to gain the magical powers of a dragon, giving him the second highest magical power in the world. Hundreds of other slimes appeared once more, so Tanya told him that they would become his new targets for training, saying that he needs to get stronger since he was their master. Realizing that he can't look like a beta in front of the girls, Rain asked Tanya to teach him her magic, and began casting fireballs at the slime. What he didn't expect, however, was how awful she was at being a teacher, but at least he managed to get stronger while completing the quest. Back at the guild, Rain had gained a massive reward for exterminating the slimes, so they began going around town eating the best food, and Rain was glad that Tanya was able to keep her mouth shut. But while at the restaurant, both the girls began devouring his meat, and Tanya shoved his giant sausage into her mouth before swallowing it. After he realized he wasn't going to have a chance lasting longer than a minute, the girls asked Rain where he learned how to be such a great beast tamer, begging him to tell them the story. So Rain went on to reveal his past. Ten years ago, Rain grew up in a village of beast tamers, and his parents would always help him learn how to get closer to animals. But those times didn't last, as his village no longer existed. Hearing those words, Kanade apologized for making him talk about something so depressing, saying she just wanted to know more about him, and Tanya told him that they would never force him to relive those moments. However, Rain knew they were asking because they cared about him, so he went on to reveal what happened. When he was 12 years old, his parents left him to tame beasts on his own, but by the time the night had arrived, he saw a plume of fire coming from his village. So he began running, and when he arrived, he saw that his entire village had been burned down, and that his family had been killed, leaving him as the only survivor. The adventurers took him in and began using him as a slave to earn his food, and after a few years, the hero Arios invited him to join their party, so Rain agreed without a second thought. After all, he thought his life would get better, but he couldn't be further from the truth. 
he became nothing but their baggage lifter and would never sleep to make sure they were safe, eventually realizing that he was being used. After telling his story, he apologized for how sad his pathetic story was, but Kanade held his hands, telling him she's finally realized why he was always risking his life to save others. It was because he truly wanted to help people and save them from the sadness he went through, saying he wasn't pathetic at all. Tanya held his hand, telling him that he's too kind for his own good, but thought that aspect of him was charming and that she was happy that he was her master. Hearing those words made Rain realize that all his pain wasn't in vain, but Tanya swore that she would burn all of them down for how awful they were. Along with her, Kanade said the hero's party were the ones who were useless, and told Tanya that she was nicer than she expected for a fatso with massive cannons. As they all laughed, Rain wished for them to stay together for the rest of time. The following morning, they headed out to defeat a group of orcs in the mountains, and Tanya burnt all of them with a single blow of her breath but Rain told them not to let their guard down yet. However, Tanya was confident she would defeat all of them without a problem, and after Kanade crushed one of them with a stone, another goblin tried running towards Tanya, but she eliminated him with her tail. From behind, she realized that she forgot about one of them, and as she was about to burn him down, he held her leg down and brought her to the ground, but she managed to burn his face off. However, another goblin appeared from behind, so Rain took the knife to his arm, and Kanade kicked the goblin away, eliminating it from existence. Tanya was worried about his bleeding, but Rain reminded her that he could heal, and began repairing his wound until it was gone. Even so, Tanya couldn't believe that she risked his life, and while they started heading back to the guild, she continued staring in shock. After getting his reward from the guild, he wondered where Tanya had went off to, so Kanade revealed that she seemed a bit down. All alone at the bridge, she realized that Rain was only worried about her, but because of her arrogance and power, she risked his life and wondered how she would ever be able to face him again. Just then, Rain appeared, asking her why she was sad, so she apologized for not taking his warning, because while it was only a small wound this time, she was scared of putting his life in danger. But Rain petted her head, saying he's just glad she was safe and that she should be more careful next time. Kanade also came to hug onto Tanya, saying she was glad she was fine, and inside the inn, Rain begged the lady for another room, saying that he couldn't endure all the torture his body was going through every night. While he slept on the hard ground, Tanya realized how he let them sleep on the bed, even though he was the one paying for the room, and wondered why she couldn't stop thinking about Rain, and how there was a warmth in her heart. She thought her feelings for Rain were becoming dangerous, but she lied to herself that she wasn't in love, telling him that she wasn't an easy hoe to get with. Keep telling yourself that, darling. Before going to sleep, she covered him up and wished him happy dreams. The following day in the forest, Tanya thought Rain might benefit from buying a weapon, and as Kanade was excited for her master to get stronger, Rain froze in his place. Before their eyes, the hero party had appeared, and Arios told Rain that it's been a long time. However, Rain decided to ignore them and keep walking away, but Arios felt sad that Rain was treating his old comrades so coldly. After Tanya asked them if they were the hero's party, Arios realized he was facing a cat spirit and a dragonoid, and thought it was impossible for a useless guy like Rain to tame them, so he thought Rain was their servant. But Kanade screamed that Rain was her master, and Rain asked them why they wanted to talk. So Arios revealed that investigating the Lost Woods was harder than he expected. The longer someone spent searching for the destination, the farther it became. So he wanted to ask for Rain's help in exploring the forest and becoming their luggage boy once more. The others told Rain that he should be grateful for even getting another chance, but Rain told them to just ask for someone else. But before he left, Mina revealed that they were looking for a noble relic because without it, the Demon King's forces would be able to destroy all of their cities, and realizing that his past was about to repeat again, Rain reluctantly agreed to join them. Arios said a worthless loser like him should have agreed from the start, and they all began mocking him. But Tanya and Kanade told them to wait, saying that before Rain could join them, they needed to apologize to him. She said that firing a man, just to go and ask him for a favor once more deserved something better than a YouTuber apology and told them to grovel on their knees, and if they weren't going to obey her commands, she'd burn them all, but didn't want to upset her master, so she was willing to spare them. The idea of groveling at the knees of Rain made the hero scream, and all of them rejected the idea of ever doing anything wrong to him. As Arios went to grab Rain, he told him to keep his pets on a tighter leash, calling them disgusting filthy animals, because even though they were good looking, they were still nothing but worthless beasts. <laughs>
the shock of getting clapped by Rain started hitting Arios, and Rain told him that he'll clap him even harder if he was to ever disrespect his comrades again. So to those words, Arios said he'll give him a chance to be a man of his words, and challenged them to a duel. After Rain accepted, all of them began facing off, and Kanade had been paired against Agath, saying she was going to beat him to his knees and force him to apologize. But Agath said he would never apologize to a useless man like him, so Kanade sprinted towards him and nearly broke his sword with her foot, but began unleashing a barrage of strikes towards the man, each one as strong as a hammer. As he tried slashing her down, Kanade evaded, and Agath activated his secret hellfire technique to slash her down but she kicked it away like it was a toy, saying that men who carry big swords and try to look like Johnny Sins are usually compensating for something. That's not ridiculous. That's not ridiculous to say that. Those words bothered Baldi, so he swore to unleash all of his powers, but Canada thought he was weak and said she'd been only using half of her power, but told him that it was nothing personal if he got hurt. As he realized she wasn't even trying, the man began trembling and wondered why someone so strong would follow Rain. In an instant, she vanished towards him, saying that Rain was stronger than they could ever be, and kicked him in the face, knocking him unconscious and breaking the tree behind him. With how badly he was unconscious, she wondered if she overdid it, but thought it was only fair a man like him got his soul sucked out. On the other side of the field, Tanya faced off against Lean and Mina, and both of them began activating their magic blasts against Tanya. But with a single snap of her finger, she neutralized both of their attacks, saying their power was as small as their chests. Both of them realized they were clapped, so they decided to release their ultimate magical spells. But Tanya snapped her finger once again, canceling their attacks. This was one of the hidden arts, Material Canceler, and it is able to destroy the fundamentals of a magic blow and eliminate its effects, saying they had no chance of beating her. Both of them began unleashing all of their magical attacks, but Tanya kept snapping her fingers while wasting their stamina. And when Mina told her that she should bow before the gods, Tanya told them that Rain was her master, and could tame over thousands of beasts, and might even tame the gods one day. However, Lean and Mina decided to put all of their energy into their final attack, but Tanya snapped in their faces once again telling them that they won't get to mock her master without a consequence. From beneath her feet, she began casting legendary level magic, saying that she will make the heavens crush their soul. The sky began turning red, and from above, they saw hundreds of sigils had materialized. As Tanya chanted her ultimate end spell and told them to accept it, they realized they were about to die, so they began apologizing and begged for forgiveness. <laughs> So, that one there was a violation, personally I wouldn't have it. Although she wanted to actually burn them, she would never want to upset her master. On the other side of the field, Arios said it was a foolish act of him to hit the hero, but before he could finish his sentence, Rain rushed to strike his worthless mouth, saying he doesn't want to listen to his bullshit. However, Arios unleashed his sword and began unleashing a barrage of strikes that Rain barely managed to avoid. Even though he was the hero, he wondered why his powers barely compared to the strength Tanya had in their duel, so he grabbed his arm, asking him if this was all he had, and punched him in the stomach to knock him down. Before he could wonder why Rain was that powerful, he smashed a rock with a single attack, but Arios continued trying to slash him down. However, Rain revealed this was the power of the beast tamer he mocked, because throughout his life, he was able to study the way beasts moved in order to tame them. So all that dedication has allowed him to see through his sword style, and with his cat spirit strength, Rain told him there was never a chance for him to win. However, Arios casted a lightning blast towards Rain, saying he also had the hero's unique magic, but as he launched his gigavolt towards him, Rain's fireball cancelled out his ultimate attack with Tanya's strength. Even so, the hero knew this was Rain's only spell, so he began activating all of his other forms of magic to attack Rain, but he managed to continue evading all of them. However, Rain hadn't used his own powers yet, so as Arios began rushing towards him, he was frozen in space and wondered why his body was paralyzed. After falling down, Rain reminded him that he was able to tame insects, because while they were fighting, he was able to locate and tame an insect using telekinesis, saying that he's been defeated. Even so, it was nothing compared to the clapping Rain was about to deliver for the way Arios disrespected his girls. So after remembering all of the hero's party abuse of him, Rain readied his fist and launched his attack towards him. When the dust settled, Rain revealed that he'd intentionally missed, because a direct impact would have ended his life in that moment. 
Just then, Tanya and Kanade came running back and hugged Rain after all of them had won. A few hours later, they began exploring the Lost Woods, but Tanya asked Rain if she could just burn the entire place down. However, Rain told her that they would be fine and began rubbing their heads, saying he was glad at how they protected him, but he still wanted to help Arios get the Holy Shield to save the world. Eventually, he found a bird to assimilate into and began flying to find the center of the forest. Although the path was hidden, he was able to find the directions they needed, and for hours, they began walking towards the location, but realized they've been walking in circles the entire time. Still, Rain thought it wasn't possible since they were walking straight for hours, so Tanya realized there was something off about the forest and activated her material search. The magical circle emanated energy orbs to lead them away, and they found a tree that was emitting illusionary magic to throw them off, and the forest had kept changing to keep them away from the center. As Kanade tried punching the tree for fooling her, a voice emanated from the tree, telling her to leave this place. From inside, a fairy appeared, an ultimate species that hadn't been seen in 200 years, and possessed magic powers greater than even the dragons. When Rain tried introducing himself, she told him to get his ugly face away, and as he kept trying to speak, she called him disgusting, and promised to kill them if they wouldn't leave. After a while of running, Tanya wondered why she had been hostile against them, but Rain thought there was a reason she was protecting the shield of truth hidden inside, so he wanted to try talking to her once again. When they got back, he told her that he just wanted the shield to protect everyone from the demons, but after she warned him that she'll begin attacking, Rain said he'll gladly take her attack if it meant gaining her trust. As she summoned her magical arrows, Rain held the girls off, knowing that risking his life for others is the best way to gain their trust. In that moment, the fairy fired her illusionary arrows towards him and was shocked that he wouldn't run away. Although she didn't understand why a human would act that way, since humans had burned her village and killed her people in the past, Rain swore that he wasn't one of those types and wished for her to trust him. However, she said he was trying to deceive her, and fired her arrows once more. But in the last moment, Tanya and Kanade stopped her from attacking their master. They tried telling the fairy that Rain had saved them when everyone wanted to use them, and the spirit thought it was weird for two ultimate species to care for a human like him. So as she extended her arm, she asked him for his name, and introduced herself as Sora, saying she was willing to listen to him. After explaining everything, the fairy revealed she couldn't give them the shield, because it was the only way for her kind to remain invisible to the humans. However, she decided to bring it back out anyway, saying that she wouldn't want humans to be killed by the Demon King, and that the fairies had promised the previous hero to hold on to his shield until the Demon King was going to be reborn. While they walked away, Rain noticed the girl was feeling upset, and turned around, asking her if something was bothering her, and if he could help her. As she tried telling him the truth, she realized that she might put them in danger, but Rain told her that even if it was dangerous, he still wanted to help her. Tanya told her that this was the kind of man Rain was, and Kanade said that they were stronger than they looked, so they all wanted to help her. Because of those words, the fairy revealed that she had a younger twin sister called Runa, who was always protecting the fairy village with them. But one day, they had to leave the barrier, and when they did, a giant monster appeared before them. But their attacks were too weak to stop the demon, and it managed to capture her sister. And when Sora ran to ask the others to save her sister, their leader blamed her for being caught, saying no one would risk their lives for her useless sister. Those words crushed the fairy, as she never wanted to lose her sister. But Rain wiped her tears away, telling her that she doesn't need to endure her pain alone, and promised that he would save her sister. She hugged onto him, finally releasing the tears she'd been hiding away. A while later, Rain managed to locate the Shadow Knight along with Runa's trapped body, and began counting down for their attack. As soon as they rushed in, Rain launched his fireball attack, and although it was ineffective, Kanade launched from above to kick him down while he was distracted, and Rain punched him away in the stomach. The knight wondered if he was the hero, but Rain told him that was a disgusting insult, saying he was here to save the fairy. Realizing he wouldn't be able to defeat them, the knight extended his sword towards Runa, but Tanya managed to block his attack and freed Runa from her shackles. After flying away, Kanade and Rain began attacking the knight together, but he was shocked at how the knight was still standing. Just then, he began spinning around to create a tornado, but Rain told Kanade he had an idea for defeating him. With a magic circle forming, Rain began searching the forest for insects and found a nest of bees that he began taming. Although the poison might have not affected him, he knew it would buy him time by distracting him, 
and in that moment, Rain activated a spell to boost Kanade's physical powers. With the spell activated, she rushed towards the knight and punched him in the stomach, creating a hole in his chest and eradicating him from existence. After he was gone, Kanade wondered what that warm energy he poured into her insides were. So to show her what it was, Rain said that he can pour his warm energy inside of her again at night. Back at the forest, the twin sisters began hugging one another, and Runa asked Sora who this new man was, saying she would allow him to tie her up and do whatever he wished to them. After fighting with each other, Sora revealed that they wouldn't be able to live in this village anymore, especially since her entire village abandoned her. However, she was worried about other demons attacking them in the forest, so Kanade asked them if they would want to join their party. Sora said that he'd already saved her sister, and Runa loved the idea of feeling how strong his body was, so she asked him if they would have them, and asked him to form a contract with them. Realizing that no one's ever tamed a fairy in the history of the world, Tanya said that she knew her master doesn't give up, so he decided to accept the challenge. Before the tree, he took up his glove and bit his finger, wondering what type of magic he could use to tame them. After analyzing all thousand forms of magic, he raised his arm and began the taming ritual, encircling both of them with the sealing ribbons, and his magical energy flowed from his hand to theirs, fulfilling the pact. Both of them saw the patterns on his hand, but Rain's energy had completely depleted, and he nearly fell onto the ground before the girls picked him up, saying they will always protect their master. Back inside the hero's mansion, the girls wondered why they needed to be hiding, but Rain handed them the shield of the truth, and Arios wondered how he managed to find the shield in two days, so he accused him of bringing a fake. At the table, Mina began appraising the shield, realizing it wasn't a fake. Before leaving, Arios wondered who those two girls were, but Rain told him it was none of their business, hoping to conceal that he'd managed to tame fairies. As he walked away with his 20 gold coins, Agoth asked him if he wanted to join their party, especially since they'd been struggling to do anything without him. All of them agreed to his invitation, and Agoth promised to pay him better and treat him better, but Rain knew none of them had changed, so Kanade told him to ignore the ugly Johnny sins and leave with them. Because of that, Rain told him to shove his offer up his bald ass, realizing that the only thing he'd wanted in this life was people that cared about him, and he'd already found them. The rest of the party thought he was a moron for denying to be part of the hero's party, but after they were gone, Arios couldn't forget about the humiliation Rain put him through, so he promised that he would kill Rain. Inside the forest, the fairies wondered what made the hero different, so Rain explained that the gods had blessed the hero with their blood giving him the limit break ability and allowing him to defeat the demon king. This special power allows the hero to grow stronger without any limits, but the girls wondered if Rain possessed a similar power. After all, he was able to take Kanade's physical strength, Tanya's magical powers, and now he was able to use fairy magic. So Kanade wondered if he would be able to keep taming ultimate species until he was able to defeat the demon king. Hearing those words shocked Rain, after all. He lived his entire life as nothing but a slave, so he never thought he would ever have people who believed in him. So to protect them, Rain promised to defeat the Demon King if he could, but thought he wasn't strong enough yet. However, the girls promised to support him when the time came, and Kanade reminded him that they'll always be by his side. The following morning, Rain realized that his room was getting packed and wished the other room would open up because he was a spineless cunt who couldn't just fucking clap some cheeks presenting themselves to him. Later that day, the hot twins clung onto his arms while they traveled to the blacksmith, and when they got there, they thought the dwarf's ugly face was intimidating them. However, Runa found a whip and imagined Rain dominating them in more ways than one. But as Sora began beating her up, Rain found a dagger that he wanted to buy. However, he realized something was off about the materials that were used, and just then, an ugly moron asked the dwarf for the best sword in his shop, before dropping all his money on the table. When the dwarf picked the best sword he had behind the counter, Rain grew angry, and although the adventurer thought it was a powerful sword before leaving, Rain wondered if that piece of garbage was the best sword the dwarf could create. After all, all of the swords in the shop looked powerful on display, but used some of the weakest materials in their core. When he asked the dwarf if he was hiding something, the dwarf smiled, saying that Rain had an amazing eye, because all of his weapons were nothing but pieces of metal he forged in his spare time. 
However, he went on to show them the real swords he poured his soul into, saying that these days, all the adventurers believe that buying an expensive sword will make them powerful, so when they're bored of his sword, they throw them out as if they were worthless. And to Donovan, every sword he created was like a child of his, so he wished to only give the ones he cared about to those who will value his sword. However, the dwarf thought only a man as considerate as Rain would be able to tell the differences between his swords, so he promised to make him a personalized weapon. But there was one issue, and the dwarf revealed that he had no material to make them, clapping Rain's dreams of getting a small dagger like his small persuasion. A few hours later, all of them went to the adventurer's guild that was packed. But when Kanade asked Ruby why there were more people than usual, she revealed that the hero was looking for supporting party members to recruit. Both of the girls noticed how Rain looked upset, but he patted them on the head, telling them that he would be alright. Just then, Ruby noticed the twins behind Rain, and wondered if they were friends of his. But Runa told her that they actually sleep in the same room at night. Hearing those words, Ruby wondered how it was possible for a disgusting loser like him to somehow become a great Muslim man with four wives. However, Rain tried telling her to do her worthless job already and asked her to approve their quest of mining for Mithril. This was the ore the dwarf needed, as it was one of the rarest elements that would create the greatest weapons. But although the dwarf had an entire mine of it, all of the ores suddenly disappeared, so Rain offered to find it for him. Donovan agreed, and asked him how much gold he wanted in return. But Rain said that the only thing he desired was the weapon he would make, shocking Donovan. This was the first time anyone's valued his creations more than money, so he promised to create the best weapon he can. A few hours later, all of them began traveling towards the mine, but Sora and Runa were too tired to keep moving forward. After all, they'd spent their entire lives like worthless loser shut-ins who never went outside and only watched anime. Yes, just like all you losers watching the video right now. You're a victim! Mm. Both of them were too tired to keep moving, and Kanade thought it was a hot day after all, but Rain knew there was water nearby, and when they got there, they begged Rain to let them go swimming. When Rain accepted, Kanade began stripping down in front of him, but his spineless ass looked away, and decided to leave them alone. However, he decided to tame two squirrels that would inform him if the girls were in danger, and decided to take a rest. Lake scene, you know what that means, plot, plot, and even more plot. However, Kanade's tail was bitten, and the squirrels weren't giving him any information, so he ran to make sure they were okay, but saw all of the girls without any plot armor. After they screamed at him, Rain apologized and swore to do anything for them. But when they heard him say those words, they asked him to just keep being the way he is. After all, he was the best leader they could ever want, but they asked him to strip down and go swimming with them without any plot armor. <laughs> A few hours later, they finally made it to the Mithril Cave, but Rain told the girls to stay hidden, because the only way such a large amount of Mithril could disappear is if there were people stealing it. From above them, Rain noticed an eagle that began alerting the bandits, and when they came out, Rain told the girls to make sure they're still alive so he could question them. However, the bitches knocked them unconscious, and Rain realized he couldn't get information out of them. But Sora said they would be able to peer into their memories to learn about what actually happened. As they got on their knees, the girls activated their memory search ability, and inside of the bandit's mind, they saw there was an entire group of them that were stealing the oars, but the girls wondered if they were useful to him. So Rain said they were, and they begged him to give them headpats, just like he did to Tanya and Kanade. So Rain began petting them on the head, and both of the girls wondered what else those hands can do. After he was done caressing them, Rain told them that there was something off about the bird's movements, because it was likely controlled by another beast tamer. Inside the cave, the group of bandits wondered what happened to their comrades, but the beast tamer revealed that they were all beaten, so they needed to hide before they were caught and ambushed them when they least expect it. As Rain walked through the cave with the girls, a massive fireball appeared, but the twins ran to deflect the blow. The mages tried to launch another attack. But the girls wanted more headpats, so they restrained the mages and eliminated their ability to cast magic. The two archers tried shooting them down with arrows, but Tanya burnt them down while Kanade knocked one of them out along with her. Once they were tied, Rain faced off against the beast tamer and told him to give up his life of robbery. However, the bandit tried rushing towards Rain, but he deflected his shot and knocked him down with a single punch. Even so, the bandit activated his most powerful summon, and from the other side of the cave, a behemoth appeared to crush Rain down. 
all of them realized it was a B-rank monster, and Rain knew only the strongest beast tamers could control them, but the bandit revealed that he'd been training it ever since it was young, and unleashed it towards them. Immediately, Rain evaded the first attack, but the cave was beginning to collapse as Rain continued dodging the blows. With a single stare, he signaled to Kanade to help the bandits escape. Once the girls had taken the bandits outside of the cave, Kanade wanted to go back inside, so Tanya promised to watch them while she helped Rain. At the same time, Rain was struggling with all the falling debris, but before the behemoth would crush him, Kanade took him away and said she would help him. So Rain told her that he would distract the behemoth while she restrained the tamer, since the monster would obey all of his commands. As soon as they got up, the behemoth tried attacking them once again, but Rain continued distracting it and evading all of its attacks. However, the cave continued collapsing, so Rain summoned a fireball to burn the behemoth. Just then, Kanade had managed to restrain the beast tamer, but he told the behemoth to continue fighting even if he was killed. The entire cave continued falling as the behemoth launched more of his attacks, and as Rain ran away, he knew that he would never let down his party, and swore to unleash all of his powers to trust in them. In that instant, the behemoth froze in space, and the beast tamer wasn't able to control his monster anymore. When he wondered what happened, the taming sigil on his arm broke apart, and Rain revealed that he used his power to overwrite his taming summon. Because even though it's impossible to overwrite one's taming sigil, he knew that if he believed in the words of his friends, he could destroy even the laws of taming. However, the bandit began screaming that he was the one who tamed the behemoth and spent his whole life training it. Those words began to destroy the behemoth's mind, so after he continued screaming at it, the behemoth started running to bite him down. In that instant, Rain used all of his mana in a fireball attack and killed the behemoth, seeing the crystal remaining once the dust settled. This was the drawback of taming a monster, because the taming sigil could only keep the monster's hatred of humans under control. A few minutes later, the bandits confessed that they all had something in common, and it was that they bought Donovan's half ass weapons. So to take revenge on him, they decided to steal his mithril ores, and Donovan thought that this was his fault after all because he'd been dishonest with both his weapons and customers, and realized he was a failure as a craftsman. Rain said that he was indeed a worthless failure of a blacksmith, Damn! but held his hand, telling him to make it right, and to only make the best weapons until the rest of his life. Those words comforted Donovan, and he swore that from now on, he would only create the best weapons, starting with Rain's personal weapon, and asked him what type he wanted. The only thing Rain wanted was a dagger with a gauntlet, but whispered into Donovan's ears a secretive idea he had for creating them. Later that night, the hero kept failing all the beast tamers, saying to one of them that he was a worthless loser who can only tame a single beast, and asked the man if he could tame an ultimate species. However, the man said that it was impossible for any beast tamer to tame one of them. After the man left, Mina realized that every single one of the people they failed were the strongest beast tamers in the nation but were all denied because they couldn't compare to Rain. And with Rain being gone, he was beginning to unleash his anger on all of them, and told her to rest for the night. But before she left, she told him to rest as well since he needed to save the world. But he knew that he couldn't save the world yet, not until he used the demonic ring he'd been hiding to kill Rain. The following day, Rain was walking around the town with Sora and Runa, while Tanya's massive cannons were asleep. But as they walked, they smelled something delicious and asked him if they could try it. So after buying some, they began swallowing Rain's sausage, and thought that his meat was the best thing they'd ever tasted. Once they were done, they asked Rain about the special ability he gained from taming them, because Kanade had gifted him overpowered strength, while Tanya gifted him near limitless mana. So when they asked him what ability he gained from them, he realized that he hadn't gained anything. However, Rain comforted them on the head, telling them that he didn't need to gain anything from them, because they were his precious comrades that were going to be by his side and that's all he'd ever wish for. Those words made them happy, and they wanted to devour more of Rain's sausage, but as they walked to the shop, a mysterious man told them to stop in their place and ask for the names of the girls. However, both of them were intimidated and tried introducing themselves, so the man began laughing, saying they will become his wives. The twins thought he was disgusting, but the man introduced himself as Edgar, the son of the Horizon Lord, so they had no choice but to accept his royal commands. As he snapped his fingers, his guards circled around Rain, and he told him to hand over his girls, but Rain swore that he would never give up the friends he cared about. After letting those words out, Edgar told his men to attack him. However, they were all knocked out by Rain, 
and the guards warned Edgar that he wasn't a regular man, so Rain told him to give it up already because he'd never give his girls up. Just then, Edgar ordered his guards to point their weapons at the civilians, saying that they're nothing but tools he'll be using to get what he wants. As he assessed the situation, Rain realized it would be impossible to save all of them, but the girls offered to save them with their magic. However, Rain knew that having them reveal their fairy magic might cause them to be outcasts of the city, and as he wondered what else he could do, he realized that he'd gained a new ability to cast multiple spells at once. So he summoned 30 different magical sigils and unleashed his fireball to burn all of the soldiers. This was the special skill he'd gained from the fairies, and he ordered Edgar to never show his worthless face again. Before leaving, Edgar swore that he'll get his revenge, and as his guards chased after him, the fairies thanked him for saving them. Along with them, all the other people thought he was cooler than the hero, but an old disgusting hag told them that they should leave now that they're safe and go somewhere far away. From the distance, the hero smiled as he pointed his ring at Rain. When they got back to their inn, Rain heard from the old hag that Edgar had been kidnapping any girl he thought was attractive and tortured them inside of his mansion. After all, he was the Lord's only son, so the Lord would silence all of the victims and kill them if they defied his orders. But when Tanya heard those words, she thought it was time to burn his entire mansion, saying that she wouldn't allow him to come after Sora and Runa, or any of the other townspeople again. However, Rain knew they needed to be careful, but wanted to save all of them. Still, he knew he was nothing but a beast tamer, but Kanade knew that Rain couldn't abandon this city and Tanya told him that they all know how he thinks, and that he wants to save everyone he meets. So they promised they would always support him, and Rain was glad to have the best comrades, so he told them that they would be saving the city from their oppressive rulers. Later that night, Horizon's lord was going to leave on vacation, but as soon as he left, Edgar ordered his strongest knight to bring Rain's head to him, paying him hundreds of gold coins for his service. Once he was gone, he remembered the humiliation Rain put him through and rang his bell for a small beast girl to appear. But as soon as she did, he grabbed her and began beating her. But all she could do was wish for someone to come and help her. The following morning, Rain headed to the Order of the Knights and tried to report Edgar's assault on them the previous day. But as soon as he let those words out, Gillette appeared, saying that there won't be any need for the knights to investigate it, and said that accusing the lord once again will have him inside the execution chamber. A few minutes later while Rain was walking with Conaday, a hot knight girl appeared from the alley, saying that she wanted to thank him for his actions. The knight introduced herself as Stella, the vice commander of the knights, and said that she's heard about how he defeated the most dangerous bandit group in all of the lands, but needed his help to bring order to her town. All of the knights had become corrupted by the money the Lord gave them, and covered up all of the Lord's crimes, especially Gillette, the commander of the knights. So she knew that with their help, there might be a chance to save the country. But when Rain wondered if they could trust her, Conade told him that she seemed like an honest girl, so Rain decided to believe her. However, they needed a plan to obtain evidence of their corruption. So over the next few days, the knights teamed up with Rain to execute their plans, and he finally received the weapons from Donovan. Eventually, they called for the knights to arrive at a mysterious building, and Stella thought it was amazing that the knights fell for their trap. The leader heard that this warehouse contained proof of their corruption, so he knew that they needed to destroy any shred of evidence, and he told his knights to destroy the target as soon as they located it. As they entered inside the building, one of his men were neutralized, and the warehouse gates were locked from the outside, with the twins freezing it down. All of the knights continued falling down, and this was the special gauntlet Rain had ordered from Donovan. But as he fired at Gillet, he was able to slash them off in the last instant, and saw that Stella had teamed up with Rain. However, she told him it was too late, as the entire order of knights were destroyed by Tanya and Conade, and she leaped down to fight him off alone, before calling him a traitor that was destroying the city. Immediately, he began rushing to slash her down, but threw his sword to distract her and punched her onto the ground, saying he was the justice of this world. However, she couldn't forget about the man she cared for and rushed forward towards Gillet, slashing him down and saying that no knight would abandon his duty for some money. A few hours later, Edgar began beating the girl after finding out that his corrupt knights were arrested. Even so, he knew that he would be able to destroy Rain with his personal guards, but the hero appeared in the window, telling him that Rain was far more powerful than he could imagine, and would be able to steal his lifestyle from him. So he threw him a ring, telling him that this ring can be used to kill off Rain, 
and would continue allowing him to rule over this land in whatever way he wishes. Inside of the girl's memories, she remembered the happy orphanage she used to live in and how everyone cared about her. But now, she wished for someone to come save her. A few moments later, Stella arrived at the Lord's mansion, telling the guards that Edgar was under investigation for corruption. However, the guards screamed for backup, and their entire army appeared to surround the girls from escaping. At the same time, Edgar knew that no one could breach his army, but the girls blew his gate up as they entered inside, and he thought it would be interesting to torture even more ultimate species. Underneath the chaos, Rain infiltrated the dungeon with the fairies, and Sora activated her searching magic to trace the flow of mana in the building. But although she was able to find the location of multiple girls, she found a single source that was on par with an ultimate species, and Rain wondered what an ultimate species was doing here. So to find out if the source was an enemy, he told the girls to save the humans while he looked for the ultimate species. As the guards continued being clapped, Rain managed to find the room where the mana source was coming from. But as soon as he opened the door, he found a poor girl behind prison doors, and realized that she was even stronger than an ultimate species, because she was actually a demigod. After healing her wounds, he told her that he was here to help her, and tried comforting her, asking her for her name. The girl cried as she said her name was Nina, and hugged onto him. In that instant, she remembered the day she was kidnapped, and how her shield had prevented her from being harmed by Edgar. However, he brought out all her orphan friends, threatening to kill them if she didn't come with him. So she begged him not to harm them, but in return, he gave her a slave collar to wear, and began beating her in front of her comrades, saying she will allow him to obtain the power of the gods one day. This was the miserable life she'd been living and Rain tried saying that he will save her, but she told him that her slave collar was impossible to take off. However, Rain told her to believe in him, and he realized that he could use his beast-taming power once again to undo the sealing powers of the collar. But the backlash of breaking the spell began electrocuting him, and Nina begged him to stop, saying that no one would be sad if she was gone. To those words, however, Rain told her that he would be sad, because even though they just met, he knew that he would be able to overcome the pain. After all, this wasn't only his strength now, but the strength of all the other girls, and using it, he was able to break the slave caller's magic, freeing Nina for the first time in three years. Outside the building, the knights continued destroying Edgar's guards, while Conade and Tanya played with them as if they were toys. One of the guards screamed at the others to use the hostages as human shields, but from the sky, Hundreds of fireballs burned them all down, and Sora and Runa told the girls that they'd rescued all of the hostages. Now that they were all safe, the girls decided to use all their powers, and Edgar realized that his armies were being completely destroyed, growing the curse on his ring. Inside of the mansion's hall, the girls found Rain carrying another girl, and wondered how many more bitches he would be picking up. However, Conade thought her tail was fluffy, and promised to cuddle her every day. But as they continued playing together, the lord of the mansion appeared and wondered how they'd already made it this far. Just then, Rain restrained the ugly fatso, but after he fell onto the ground, his son appeared, summoning the fucking Grim Reaper from his ring, and killed Rain in that instant. This was all part of the hero's plan, and he was glad to have Rain die like the pathetic garbage he was, before flying away. Inside the mansion, however, Rain was still alive, and all the girls hugged onto him, wondering how he was still fine after being attacked by an instant death status effect. As they wondered how that was possible, Sora decided to cast the poison status effect onto him, and thought she had accomplished her mission. All of the girls wondered what was wrong with her brain-dead actions, so she revealed that Rain hadn't gained only one power from taming two fairies but instead, had gained two abilities. One of them was the multiple spell cast ability, while the second one was the ability to nullify all special status effects cast onto him, saving him from the demon's attack. As Edgar stared in jealousy at Rain's harem, he knew that he wished they would all die, but the ring's vile powers activated, and began swallowing him inside. As it fed onto his soul, Rain knew he'd felt that power before, and casted a fireball with all of his mana, but the attack was unable to lay a single scratch onto the beast. From inside, piles of smoke began searing, and a hand emerged to the outside. The demon asked them if they were the ones who reawakened him, and Rain knew the presence of this demon. After all, it was the same demon that killed his parents and burned his entire homeland, leaving him stranded for his entire life. It was the same beast, standing before his eyes, and it promised to kill them in the most gruesome ways possible. However, he realized there were thousands of other humans nearby, so he flew away and began preparing to hunt them. Once he arrived to the city, the demon began blowing up all of their homes and burning down the streets, 
But Kanade kicked him down from the sky, and the demon saw that Rain's group had managed to catch up to him. As he stared at them, Rain swore to destroy him, and Kanade launched off a building to punch him towards Tanya before she knocked him down, while Rain used his gauntlet to restrain the demon from moving. Although it didn't have any effects on the demon, it was part of their plan to distract him, and the fairies launched a massive explosion to burn the demon down. But when the dust settled, the demon walked out of it unscathed, realizing that he would need to call reinforcements to even the fight. From the ground, hundreds of demonic servants began rushing towards Rain's party, but the girls used their magical abilities to eliminate them instantly. Although they were worthless, the demon revealed that he can summon an infinite amount of them, and reminded them that he was also able to attack them at the same time. As the others ran to Kanade, Tanya flew to the sky to destroy all of the worthless monsters, and while they tried to heal Kanade, Tanya used her flaming breath to hold off the demon's attack. However, it wasn't enough to stop the demon, and after blowing her away, Rain ran to make sure she was okay. But she got up and pretended she was fine. Seeing how his attacks were ineffective, the demon decided to unleash his magical energy to the sky, raining down explosions to burn the entire city down. This was the same scene Rain went through all those years ago, so he used all of his fireballs to attack the demon, while the fairies launched a holy light sphere from the sky to pierce his heart. Just then, Rain decided to insert his warm magical energy deep into the girls to overpower them, and once it penetrated deeply inside, the girls rushed forward to beat up the demon. Just then, the fairies activated their judgment ability, and Kanade leaped from the sky to crush the demon down. But once the dust settled, the demon was still unscathed. With a single snap of his finger, he summoned hundreds of dragons and ground beasts, but the real target was the villagers of the Horizon City. So as he tried to get away, Tanya launched her fire breath towards him, but he sacrificed some of his dragons to block the attack, telling them that the battle was over. As Rain wondered how he could save all of the villagers and defeat the demon, Runa and Sora told him that they could finally be of use to him, and that they would teleport all of the villagers to safety while they kept fighting him. At the same time, Mina wondered if they should be fighting off the demon, but the hero told them that their only target was the Demon King, saying they wouldn't help any of them. After all, he knew that there was no chance for Rain to survive this demon, the same one that killed his family. Meanwhile, Sora and Runa managed to find Stella and the Knights, asking them to bring all of the citizens back so they could teleport them away. But when they were gone, they told Nina that everything would be fine since Rain would save them. At the same time, Kanade continued beating all of the demons while Tanya burnt them away and they told the others to get away safely. On the other side of the city, the guards had gathered all the remaining citizens, but they realized that the girls were fairies, and couldn't trust them since fairies hated humans. However, the man whose sausage they devoured came, and he asked them how his meat tasted. When the girls said that his big sausage tasted juicy, he was glad to hear that, telling the others that they were just like them. One of the girls and her grandma remembered the time they were saved by them, and slowly, all the others realized they could actually trust the fairies. Together, they teleported most of the citizens away, but just then, the monsters had found their hideout, so Runa and Sora decided to split up their powers to teleport the others away. As Kanade and Tanya continued fighting the beasts, the other adventurers arrived, and the knights revealed that this was the orders from the Adventurers Guild. And when Ruby begged them to help Rain's stinky ass and his comrades, Donovan came with a crate full of weapons, saying that his greatest creations were going to be free as he had a debt to repay to Rain. So the adventurers created a line for him to fight the demon, and Rain thanked all of them, promising to save the city now. At the same time, Sora teleported the citizens away while Runa burnt all of the demons, and Nina wondered how she could also be helping them. She'd been scared her entire life, so she wondered if it was always okay to be the one getting protected. And once Sora was done teleporting all of the villagers away, she realized that Nina had gone missing. At the same time, Rain realized that the demon was still too far away, but Tanya knew her dragon form would only make her a target to be instantly eliminated, while the fairy's teleportation magic would take too long to activate for Rain to use it. Just then, Nina ran to hug Rain, saying that she can't run away while others protected her, so she wanted to help them out. Both of the girls realized that she was the demigod they needed, as demigods were the only ones capable of instant teleportation. So Rain asked her if she could help him, and she promised that she would. But just then, a horde of beasts began approaching them, so Kanade and Tanya promised to take care of them while Rain dealt with the demon. However, the demon thought Rain was a foolish insect, and tried to blast him before he spider-manned away, and continued evading all of his attacks with his gauntlet. 
Once he got closer to his height, the demon prepared his ultimate blow, but Nina teleported them away in the last instant. Together, they began flying closer to the demon, and although the demon realized they were using this ability to fly, Rain decided to boost his own powers, but the demon told him that it was already over for him. As he unleashed all of his dragons, Rain revealed that his boost could do more than enhance physical abilities, and teleported closer to the demon, sealing him with his taming bands. However, the demonic aura began spreading to Rain, and as it swallowed all of him, Rain knew there was people who cared about him. That counted on him, so he awakened the taming god powers inside of him, overriding all of the dragon's taming. Even in all the millions of years the demons lived, this was the first time anyone's accomplished the impossible, and Rain raised his hand, saying that he couldn't do this without his comrades. As the demon freed himself, Rain launched all of the dragons towards him. As the demon was about to vanish, he wondered what his name was, but Rain said that he ain't no snitch, and the demon vanished away. However, Nina's mana was completely drained, and they began falling towards the ground before Tanya managed to catch them. At the same time, Kanade and all the other girls were waiting for him, and the sun began to rise after the evil was extinguished. Three days later, the girls began helping the others in rebuilding the city, and the store manager kept feeding the fairies his massive sausage. After a few hours passed, Nina told Rain that she wanted to keep helping him on his adventures, but Rain didn't know if he could even tame a demigod. However, all the girls knew he'd already accomplished far greater things, so he took off his gloves before biting his finger and began the summoning ritual. The taming seals began surrounding her, and after she said her name back to him, the magical sigil bands began flowing into her hand, sealing their contract as his new pet. Kande was glad to have a new smaller sister, but Tanya wanted to also cuddle her, and Runa was glad to have a new younger sister that wasn't a grumpy bitch like her current one. <laughs> All of them were glad to have a new sister in the group, and Rain smiled seeing how all of them were happy. Later that day at the Adventurer's Guild, Ruby said that Rain was promoted to C-Rank, and that all of the Adventurers agreed that he deserved to jump all the way from E-Rank directly. When he heard that he was going to be a top G, he revealed that their inn was getting too small, and wondered if there was a bigger room that their broke asses could move into. But after hearing that, Ruby told him that it would be better for them to buy a home, since she could use it to trap them in the city. Even so, all the girls thought that it would be amazing to have a home where they could live together, so Rain agreed that they should all buy a house. But after a while of seeing dumbass-looking homes, they realized there might not be any homes for them. Just then, however, Ruby showed them the final home, saying it was a beautiful mansion with a massive bathtub for all the plot development they would want, and was even the cheapest home in the entire nation. However, Tanya thought something was fishy, and it wasn't the way Ruby smelled. <laughs> since this deal seemed way too good to be true. So Ruby decided to reveal the truth, saying that the house is actually haunted. While the rest of them were fine, Kanade screamed because she couldn't handle ghosts, and when Runa wondered what the ghosts would do, Ruby said they were awful. They would flip your pillow over, make bath water cold, and even put curry underneath your seat so it looks like you shat yourself. All of them thought this wasn't that serious, but Kanade said she could just sleep outside if it was necessary. However, Rain thought it was worth seeing how the house was inside before deciding, and they all entered inside. As they walked deeper into the house, Nina sneezing gave Kanade a heart attack, but Tanya realized that the house was actually clean for how abandoned it was. Just then, however, all the furniture began moving and a woman's voice began screaming at them to get out. Before their eyes, a hot maid appeared, and the fairies thought they could use their magic to make her disappear. But she kept reappearing in front of them, and grew angry as she screamed at them to leave. When she saw that, Tanya realized that the maid probably had no attack magic, and although they uncovered her secret, she saw Kanade's vulnerable ass and decided to bully her to get out. But when she was cornered, Kanade swore that she wasn't afraid, and managed to slash down her magical body. Her fear allowed her to transcend the abilities of her ultimate species, and she began using astral attacks while attempting to bite off the ghosts. At the same time, the twins created an astral barrier so she would be unable to escape, and Tanya held Kanade off before she devoured the maid. Once they were calm, Rain asked her if she wanted to talk now, but the maid thought she needed to possess Rain. However, he commanded her to stop, and in that instant, she froze in her place. When she wondered how that was possible, he revealed that an old man taught him about phantom taming. But when she asked him to go on, 
he told her that was the whole story. Even the ghost wondered how that explained his broken overpowered abilities, but all the other girls were used to it. With his powers, he was able to push her to the ground, so the maid gave up and told them to just burn her up. However, Rain decided to introduce himself to her, saying that he wanted to just talk. After hearing those words, she thought he was interesting, and introduced herself as Tina Holy, a maid who died serving inside of this house. When Tanya wondered how she ended up as a ghost, Tina revealed that her previous boss was a womanizer sadist who killed her off, so she became a ghost without even knowing it. However, she realized that it was time for her to move out instead of scaring them. But Rain asked Kanade if she was still scared of her, so she told him that she would be fine as long as all of them were with her. As Rain patted her on the head, all of them smiled, and he asked her if she would like to live with them. After all, her existence made the home's price cheaper, so he wanted her to stay anyway, and Tanya told her to just accept his kindness. So he stood up, telling her that he looks forward to living with her, and she agreed to become part of his party. Back inside the guild, Rain signed the contract to own the home, and Ruby thought it was amazing how he was able to add even a ghost to his party. So Ruby welcomed him, saying that Horizon was now his home. But those words shocked Rain, and he was glad to finally have a place to call home. At the same time in the city, the hero approached a shopkeeper, demanding a week's worth of rations from him for free. However, the shopkeeper said he didn't have anything to offer to their ugly ass, saying that they were a worthless party that couldn't care less about their city that was under attack. Hearing his insolence, they thought about getting rations from a different shopkeeper, but all of them swore that they wouldn't help a worthless hero like him, and all the villagers told him to get his cowardly party out of their city. Seeing that he was cornered, he slashed down the shopkeeper's stand before leaving. As he walked, one of the villagers said that the beast tamer was more of a hero than he would ever be, and Ario swore to kill Rain one day. Later that day, Kanade was glad that Rain would finally sleep on a bed instead of the floor. <laughs> that night, Tina prepared a feast for them with Runa, and all the girls were excited to devour Rain's meat. Just then, Nina thanked Rain, saying that she was finally not alone because of him. After hearing those words, he remembered how he had lost everything in this world, and how a hole had opened in his heart ever since. Although Tina thought they were lucky to be a family, the girls said that she wasn't alone either, because she was now part of their family. As Rain stared at them, he realized that joining the hero's party was nothing but escapism from the void he felt while living alone. But now that he had people who actually cared about him, he finally remembered how it felt to have a family. As all the other girls stared at him, they wondered why he was crying and he played it off as if he was just crying to eat the food already. But deep down, he knew that it was because of all the new bonds he'd created on this adventure, the new home he gained, and the new family he can always come back to. Watch this next video, till next time my fellow legendary plot masters.